thank you for your time. This is the city of Nashville. Um, how do we mitigate the impact of urban flooding on vulnerable populations? I'm really excited today. We have a great, great group of people with us. Uh, Bethany, if you could move to the next slide, please. So this just gives you an overview of the topics for today. Um, there'll be a brief introduction from me. The senior advisor to Mayor John Cooper, Faye DiMassimo, will be speaking. We'll have a brief video from the mayor, and then we'll get into the guts of the program with Dr. Janie Camp from Vanderbilt acting as our moderator. Next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of what we're doing here, uh, the Smart Cities Council has been working with Nashville now for about four months in terms of helping them accelerate the implementation of different types of solutions and projects that will mitigate the impact of urban flooding. I think you'll see when we get into the guts of this that urban flooding has had has, has a tremendous impact on Nashville. And uh, the mayor and the staff here that we're working with are committed to resolving some of these issues. Nashville, like any city, starts in the place where we've got a problem. How do we help people? What do we use to, to help them with? Most cities, when they go to procurement, only know about 30% of the available solutions. And then the perennial question is, how do we pay for it? Most cities in the world, only about 11% of them, in fact, actually can fund their own projects. So Nashville is like all of us. They're in a place where they have a concept, they have a need, and they need to get to some kind of certainty where there are solutions, they understand the stakeholders, and they understand the funding. The Smart Cities Council now has been doing this for eight years. We've done approximately 85 of these collaborative engagements around the world, all the way from Australia through India, Europe, and North America. And these are at no cost to cities. And what we do is we bring in cities from all around the world to help. And then finally, we bring in experts, and the end result is an online collaborative roadmap that Nashville will be able to use to go to the next step with its city council and decision makers. Now, I'm going to introduce Faye DiMassimo, who is the senior advisor to Mayor John Cooper. Good morning, Faye. Good morning, Philip. It's great to be with you all this morning and welcome to Nashville virtually here. Um, it's my <laughs> deep honor to introduce Mayor John Cooper to share remarks on Metro Nashville smart flood management efforts and our equity focus. Mayor Cooper. Thank you, Faye, and for that kind introduction. And on behalf of the city of Nashville, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Smart City Council meeting. Nashville is proud to serve as a readiness challenge cohort leader for this important collaboration and discussion. Rising global temperatures are a danger to human and environmental health and pose serious economic risks for cities. By acting boldly to understand and address climate risks, such as flooding, we can improve the lives of Nashvillians today and build a safer, healthier future for generations to come. Now, since a thousand year flood devastated our city in 2010, Nashville has made substantial progress on sustainability so that we're better prepared for both the heavy precipitation that's becoming more and more frequent across the Southeast US, as well as the next major flood event that might happen right here. We've bought out nearly 400 properties in the floodplain, many of which had flooded multiple times, enabling now families to move to much safer areas. We've also fully embraced urban forestry best practices as a stormwater control measure by placing new requirements on developers, both to preserve and grow our area tree canopy, and we've launched Root Nashville, an ambitious public-private campaign to plant a half a million new trees by 2050. These efforts to restore the natural functions of our landscape in mitigating floods and addressing storm water management challenges are helping us build the resilience that we need for our residents today and for future generations of Nashvillians. As we develop a new climate adaptation plan for Nashville this year, we are excited to partner with the Smart Cities Council to dive into how we can use data to build better models of urban flooding 
and inform our stormwater management strategies for the future. Our goal is to forecast the stormwater impacts of Nashville's growth and development, as well as how green infrastructure can become a bigger part of our flood prevention toolbox. We've had a meaningful experience working with the Smart Cities Council to accelerate this vision. We will apply the same principles we are using in the development of the Metro Transportation Plan to address equity considerations, not only as part of our planning process, but also as we design our transportation plan. Equity in transportation and local infrastructure design is equally valuable in our approach to urban flooding. This collaborative engagement will allow us to share what we've learned. While hearing from other cities facing the same challenges, older neighborhoods and often our most vulnerable neighbors and communities are impacted in flood prone areas. By engaging citizens in a new stormwater management strategy, we hope to guide future investment in green and gray infrastructure towards neighborhoods that may have been historically overlooked and underserved. Every year, heavy rainfall flooding costs Nashville millions of dollars in property damage and economic disruption. Our willingness to plan and prepare is what will position Nashville to withstand and bounce back from climate threats that are increasingly going to be part of 21st century urban life. We must make smart investments that address our challenges head on, that help us build a Nashville that's healthy, prosperous, sustainable, beautiful, and most importantly, one that will make us ready for whatever climate altered future may have in store for us. We can prepare for the next heavy storm and the one after that, and the one after that. We can do it together. Thank you for the opportunity to help realize a more sustainable Nashville through the Smart City Council. We've developed a new approach to making sure that we consider equity as a, a top of mind issue in all of our infrastructure development and planning. Our approach is to use an equity lens in the planning, design, construction, and operation of each project in our infrastructure programs and plans. That lens builds an equity contribution at the project level that means that we're building a stronger system with each project and complements the more traditional equity goals that are typical at the system um, or plan level um, in a community. We're excited to move this forward, both in infrastructure projects like um, flood management and also in our transportation uh, plan that has recently been completed and believe it's a critical path approach. To give you a, an idea of, of how comprehensive it is in its consideration of equity, um, we have a series of questions that comprise this equity lens tool that are, as I said, analyzed for each project in order to build the strongest equity value contribution that's available in whatever particular project is done. It can be customized for your community as well. Uh, the ones that we chose were measures of accessibility, so, so measures around schools, improving access to health care, to education facilities, and how wayfinding is incorporated into enhance the visitor interaction and experience in a community. How we, are we reaching populations of varying age? How are youth and senior populations served? Safety, how does project design um, enhance security for all through lighting, um, other kinds of measures that are applicable um, and that are developed in conjunction with all of our infrastructure business groups within Metro Nashville? How does the project design serve land uses or economic development projects that are noted in our case, in our comprehensive plan, Nashville Next, and in other Metro Nashville plans. How is pedestrian movement and safety enhanced and movement of cyclists? And then we go to uh, a, a, a bucket, if you will, around connectivity. Are there special needs populations? Because that's really at its core, I think what equity is really about is connecting the community to the places that they need and want to go. So are there special needs populations in the area? And how will the project design accommodate and enhance those connections? Is there transit service? 
How does the project enhance the connection to the transit service that's in the area? How are economically disadvantaged communities better connected to employment areas and centers? And how is network connectivity, the ability to move around easily and safely and efficiently in your community through the project, the, whatever that particular project is that's being developed. Additionally, we also have included metrics around outreach, how the community outreach is being adapted to innovatively reach all, and how specific language access measures um, are included in outreach and design. And then on the environmental side, we have a particular component around stormwater management and sustainability. These are all a, a very comprehensive way to think about, again, not, not equity as a goal or an aspiration or even a performance measure at a system level, but literally how is it being designed and built into each and every project? Because if each and every project is making that strong equity value contribution, then the systems in our communities will necessarily be more equitable. Um, and that, that is an overview of, of that system. And hopefully, Philip, we're ready to go back to the mayor. You got it. It's, my, it's also my honor this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Janie Camp, Vanderbilt University. She's research associate professor, professor of civil and environmental engineering and focuses on data analyses and visualization to inform decisions, improving the resilience of infrastructure systems and communities. Uh, we couldn't be led today by anyone better suited to the conversation in this discussion. Janie, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Faye. I am thrilled to be part of this conversation. It's quite an honor to be um, working with Metro as they go through this process of looking at um, smart cities and how we can better plan for the future considering vulnerable populations. Um, today, I'm serving as a moderator, and um, I have the pleasure to work with, um, prior to this and hopefully moving forward, some great people within the Metro government. Um, so I'm going to introduce the first piece of this that we're going to talk about is Nashville's data story so related to urban flooding um, issues in the area. So I'm going to um, introduce Roger Lindsay, who's a licensed engineer and floodplain manager. He's the practice leader for stormwater and floodplain management for Metro Water Services. And Jennifer Higgs, who is the GIS lead architect um, in Metro planning. And um, so they're going to talk a bit about kind of the history and where we're at today regarding using data to inform decisions and what data we've been working with here in Nashville um, in the past decade. So, Roger. Great. Thank you, Janie. Thanks. It's been 10 years now since the historic May 2010 flood in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and even after all that time, often pictures to tell the real story of a flood event. As you can see, this first picture of flooding on the interstate, um, obviously uh, these people had no con no idea that, that water was that deep, and and uh, but the water rose fast and, and the water stayed with us for a good while. Uh, the second uh, picture is uh, uh, shows an example of flooding uh, in the downtown uh, Nashville area. This is at the foot of uh, Lower Broadway and First Avenue. This is this is where it all happens, honky tonk heaven. Um, but it was a it was a severe event, and um, it uh, it really crippled the um, the downtown Nashville area. An extreme event uh, defined by roughly 13 to 16 inches of rain over a 36 hour period over all of the metro area uh, and over most of the western half of the state of Tennessee. By any measure, a 13 to 16 inch rain event over a day and a half would be an extreme event. But some eight years later, I was introduced to the term atmospheric river. Uh, and that was, in fact, what we had experienced. During conversations with uh, Dr. Kerry Talbot with the US Army Engineer Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, uh, he was telling me about research that they are doing on, on the role of atmospheric rivers on the West Coast but they'd also documented the occurrence of a number of similar events uh, in, the, um, in the Gulf Coast area in the Southeast United States. And indeed, the Nashville flood had been caused by such an extreme weather event. Um, Dr. Talbot showed me this slide. It was, a, it was a cover slide for a presentation that was being done. 
and it featured the Nashville event. Um, and so you can see that these atmospheric rivers, this was born out of the uh, kind of what I call the equatorial Pacific Ocean. It kind of forms over the Yucatan Peninsula and then it blows at high altitudes across the Gulf, uh, where in our case, it struck a stalled cold front where it dumped. And um, uh, there, were, there were significant areas west of us that, that got upwards of 20 inches of rain during the same day and a half. But it was a severity. Jenny, uh, Jenny if we can go to the, the uh, next slide, public safety. When we talk about the severity of the event, one of the acknowledgments was that we didn't know enough uh, about our system. Things like, you know, how to correlate between gauge readings uh, and the topography on the ground. Um, we, uh, we know we needed a lot more data. We needed broader coverage of our USGS gauging stations, and we needed to be able to correlate, again, those gauge readings to topography on the ground, which led to significant efforts uh, to incorporate inundation mapping uh, into the tool that became Nashville Safe. And I describe Nashville Safe as a flood forecasting tool. You can see the home screen um, on the uh, Nashville Safe flood forecasting tool. And as, as we look at the various little triangles, the, the green triangles, those, each of those represents the location of USGS gauging station. Uh, and as an event occurs, they change color to correlate to the National Weather Service's color coding. Um, the, um, it, it's, a, it's an interactive, real-time GIS-based tool that allows us to see conditions on the ground during emergency activations. Um, when we click on one of those triangles, as you can see in this slide, it, it opens up either the USGS gauge uh, site for that gauge, or it opens below that, you can see the National Weather Service, uh, the hydrograph of that event. You can see how the water rises, in this case, up into an action level, and then it comes back down. The next slide uh, is a simulated high water event um, over the southern half of the city. So if you'll notice that the triangles now are no longer light green in that lower half, um, but they're color coded. And those that are orange are, are a lesser extent, those that are red, represent a major flood level. And each of the small little round icons on this represents a, a, a point in our system where perhaps there's water in a roadway or water over a bridge. And, and um, so it, it really gives us, because we're, we're sitting in the emergency operations center watching this on the screen, and it allows us to make response uh, plans. Now, the next slide is simply another component of what we uh, are referring to as, as a public safety. This is, this is continuing on for months and years after the flood, but it kind of represents um, the, um, the, the home buyout, an aggressive program to buy out homes uh, that are located in risky, flood-prone areas. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, that in some of the following sections. Um, the next slide introduction to the fact that we, we acknowledged we needed new gauges, we doubled the number of gauges within the Nashville system, uh, and then the, uh, ultimately the transition to real-time flood modeling. As we've continued, we continue over 10 years now to enhance the capabilities of our flood forecasting. Um, and this, working with the Nashville District Corps of Engineers, we've, we've created real-time simulation models that allow us to forecast ahead to anticipate the extent of flooding in a stream. This is an example of the Hurricane Harvey event. We call it the the um, uh, the uh, the Harvey the remnants of Harvey storm that occurred in in August of 2017. Uh, the the map on the left shows the extent of some of the rain that fell upwards of uh, of eight and nine inches up in the north northwestern quadrant of the city, uh, and then you can see overall how this. The system allows us to grid rainfall over an area based on, on weather service radar information. And so I'll call your attention to the middle of the screen, the little small uh, dark outlined area. That's the White's Creek Basin. That's the basin that was most severely impacted by the remnants of Harvey Storm. And the next slide shows the, um, the outline of that, that basin. That's the White's Creek Watershed Basin. And you can see that there are literally hundreds of cross sections across creeks and streams within that region. Uh, this is the actual readout from the HEC RTS real-time simulation model 
Uh, and then the next slide uh, shows the um, uh, the actual the, the action level tool that RTS allows us to do. So upper left uh, part of that printing is a uh, that sheet screen is a, a summary of all the, the gauges that are part of this real time simulation model. It allows us to look in summary of what's going on in our gauges. And I think the most pertinent part of this entire program uh, is that it gives you action level information for these various forecast points. And the, the graph on the lower right, that hydrograph shows, uh, that's a future projection. We're looking ahead um, and we know from where we are at this moment that we expect that gauge to, in this case, that gauge went all the way up almost to the major flood level. Uh, and that's a future projection for that gauge. And you see it come down and it makes another little another little blip, another little rise. Um, uh, and then after the fact, we're able to go back and compare those forecasted um, uh, pro uh, hydrograph projections with what actually happened. So it allows us to fine tune that process going forward. So that kind of concludes the, the discussion we've got about our, our latest effort, the real-time simulation. So uh, Dr. Camp, I will turn it back over to you. Janie, you're mute. Sorry about that. Um, so as you can see, Nashville has been working with partners like the Corps of Engineers and making investment locally to increase safety for urban flooding events. Um, and the Nashville Safe Tool allows them to use, you know, better precipitation data to know what areas of the community are going to be impacted before they're impacted. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit, um, and Jennifer Higgs um, in planning is going to talk about how uh, we're now starting to look at data um, for additional applications, specifically looking at um, kind of some of the vulnerabilities of community members. So Jennifer, I'll hey. let you cover. Hi, thanks. Um, as part of the team, safe team, um, you know, our real our focus at the beginning was um, immediate life safety, and then we want to look at how we can use that data that came out of safe um, to better focus our efforts towards um, those that are more vulnerable in the community and using that data and other data provided. Um, so this map is looking at the damage levels that came out of the 2010 flood and looking at the different neighborhoods. And overlaying that with our floodplain and um, the CDC social vulnerability index for 2018. So this data looks at both um, socioeconomic, um, household and disabilities, minority and housing and transportation vulnerability in the community. And we can look and see where we had the most extreme flooding during the 2010 event and current and future events um, against this vulnerability index and see um, what neighborhoods we might need to uh, focus on. Next slide. So again, here's the same data with that with our home buyouts, and we can look at where have we historically bought out homes, and what, where might we um, now target those future home buyouts. Um, you can see out of our our home buyouts so far that. Um, 71% of our home buyouts have been in those um, most vulnerable areas. Next slide. So we've taken data from our 311 system, um, Hub Nashville, and our 911 system on calls related to where people are reporting flooding over the last three years. Um, and we've done a clustering of these points and this this hex bin map shows where calls have come in at the most extreme levels so from yellow to red uh, the most number of calls I overlaid that with our floodplain so we can see that if you look at this map there's a lots of areas in the county that do not have necessarily river or stream flooding but are still reporting calls um, due to flooding and so we want to look at what are those other impacts that could be causing all of these um, calls related to flooding that are not stream flooding. Next slide. So here we've 
overlaid this with our infill development. So infill development, we consider those things that happen with our, in our urban services or core district to the community that are one and two family homes coming in, not in the suburban area of the county, but in the more urban area of the county, coming in and fitting maybe two homes on one lot where there used to be um, traditionally one unit on that lot. And comparing that into those neighborhoods where we also see these calls, this high call volume. Next slide. So this is a, a closer in shot of our East Nashville area. And as you can see that um, the, the road going, the red road going up the middle is our is Ellington Parkway. And it is kind of a borderline between the more vulnerable uh, populations and less vulnerable populations. And it also shows where we have had a lot of infill development and, um, over the last several years. And on top of that, you can see the density of the call volume for 311 and 911 related calls. This is an area that does not have a major um, river or stream running through it, but we do get a lot of calls um, for other types of flooding issues. Next slide. Well, before we move on, Jennifer, do you want to speak yeah. to the gentrification that's been happening in this area and how yes. different it might look compared to 10 years prior? Right, if we, if we, if you compare the social vulnerability index from back in 2010 to, to this slide, um, it's, it's fairly drastically changed. This, the area to the east of the slide was definitely more highly vulnerable in the past, but has undergone lots of infill, lots of changes in that, those East Nashville neighborhoods. Um, and we, as you can see on the left, we also have a lot of, uh, a lot of infill happening on, on in all parts of this this area. So, you know, we want to look at does that, that infill affect um, the flooding that could be happening into those other neighborhoods? Thanks. And also, what we were looking at through these 911 calls is we did a. Um, Use space uh, space time cube, uh, so that's an interesting way to look at GIS through space and time of these calls. Because you might look at a heat map and see a lot of calls in an area over a three-year period, but we need to know whether this is an area that's emerging as a trending area for flooding or an area that is improving. And this area here is Murfreesboro Road, which, as you can see, is trending um, down. So the number of calls are decreasing over time. And this is an area where we've done mitigation efforts and, re and done repairs um, to the system. And the number of calls, you know, early uh, before we did the work, where we had a high number of volume of calls, and now the number of calls down in this area have gone down. Great, thanks. So this is a few examples of how Nashville is starting to use data to inform decisions and also potentially investment um, through home buyout or um, other infrastructure. Um, this is a great example of being able to show that investment in infrastructure to mitigate flooding has reduced the um, concerns of citizens and impacts. And so next up, um, Tom Palco, who's the Assistant Director of the Stormwater Division at Metro Water Services and a licensed engineer in certified floodplain manager and I are going to have a conversation about future considerations um, and future needs for Nashville. And this is where being part of the Smart Seas Council, uh, we hope will be beneficial for the community to get ideas from other communities and cities that are wrestling with these um, issues. Uh, I think it should be noted that we um, have not really started looking at the vulnerabilities until we started prepping for this webinar and meeting. And it was eye-opening to many of us uh, when we started looking at the maps that Jennifer was creating. Um, so I think there's good food for thought and seeing some um, understanding and ideas here. So Tom and I have a few prompting questions that we've identified. Um, Tom, can you speak to the um, historic approach to um, both the buyout and also infrastructure investment for the community? Sure. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so as far as the home buyout goes, we've, we've essentially taken three approaches, and those three approaches are based on what funding sources are available. The majority of the past projects we have done have been through FEMA, through the mitigation grant programs. And when we do these projects, the, the criteria that we use for a FEMA project is typically what's the risk of this house flooding in the future, and it's based on what has happened in the past. So FEMA, with, through the National Flood Insurance uh, Program, keeps records of, of flas, uh, past claims that have been paid out on flood insurance. So we use that data to hone in on where we need to go. Under those programs, under those projects, we pay fair market value. We do not pay to relocate the owners or the residents, and, and we do not condemn. It must be on a willing seller basis. The second approach we've taken as of late has been the U.S. US Army Corps of Engineers. And we do that through a partnership agreement. And the criteria that the Corps of Engineers uses for home buyout is the risk of future flooding based on where the house sits in relationship to the flood elevation. So they do a benefit cost analysis. And in their projects, they will either schedule houses to be removed or elevated. Internally, we have made the decision not to use any funds and not to elevate in place. If we're going to take to touch a house, we're going to tear it down because if you leave the house on a property, there still is a lot of risk. Through the Corps of Engineers projects, we do pay fair market value, but we also have the ability to pay more based on the, the likelihood that the, the folks living there can find a suitable house at that same price. And also with the Corps of Engineers, we do we must be able to say that we can use eminent domain and condemn where necessary. And in so doing, we also do pay to relocate both the owners and the renters of those properties. The third approach we take is this 100% funded through our, through our capital program. And the criteria we use there is it's an economic decision. If I have a localized issue where I've got a creek that, or a ditch that runs between some houses, and I can't physically make the ditch big enough to carry the storm I need to storm, then we look at is it more cost effective to go ahead and just buy that house and take that house out of the way and give room for the water. And we also have used Metro Metro money in cases where um, the, the property owner refused or, or didn't want to participate in a previous previous offer. And, and now that they've had a change of part or they've had a, another flood, they're willing to sell and then we go there. So as far as infrastructure investment, you saw the maps and saw how the heat maps. We really don't use those maps per se, but we do kind of look at that data. The, the maintenance activities we do is probably the easiest thing we do. When, when someone calls or we see something, it's just a matter of, is this work we need to do? And if it's work we need to do, it's just a matter of getting it scheduled. With the capital program, it's a little more, it's a little more complicated. We do look at those calls coming in, but we've got to look again was this call based on just the fact that we had one of those big rains that Roger talked about and the system is functioning to a certain level, but the rain just exceeded that, what could be expected is up to, to create a, a system that will handle that. So we do look at that and everything we do on the capital projects, we do report that data on a, on a, county, uh, on a councilmanic district basis. So, Tom, looking at the maps that Jennifer uh, provided, um, we had a good conversation with Jennifer and Roger the other day about um, some of those areas that are not out of bank flooding and the potential because the infrastructure is aging or can't tie in um, appropriately, the potential for green infrastructure to mitigate some of that um, is called nuisance flooding. So of those low-lying areas where the infrastructure just can't handle some of these intense events. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so we do, when, when infill development does occur, there are provisions on each of those sites where they have to do what they can to control the runoff. It's through rain gardens and other green infrastructure practices. So we do have the ability as new development occurs, they are doing more than they used to do in these infill developments. And we also are, are starting to turn the corner where we are doing projects that are, that are green projects. You know, and when we do a capital project, we also look to see if there's any green component that can be done. Obviously, with, with, with nuisance flooding, green may be, be a solution, but in the home buyout where we have a out-of-bank creek, there, are, there aren't any green solutions available to us other than, again, we've got to go buy the house and take it down. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, and to date, 
so how much have you all looked at the vulnerable populations? Um, I know I've heard from you and Roger multiple tales of the individuals, um, lots of anecdotal tales of who's been impacted by flooding and the buyouts. Um, but to what extent are vulnerable populations part of that, you know, thought process? We really haven't purposefully up to this point looked at that data to make our decisions. When we're buying things with, with FEMA money or any, any outside source, the funding is always limited. So we always try to get as much as we can with the limited dollars. So if I have a million dollars, then I can buy four $250,000 houses as opposed to two $500,000 houses. We've been kind of forced or, or pushed or interested in going where we can get the most houses. So that does push us into the areas where those vulnerable populations are. When we saw the maps that you presented earlier, it was kind of fascinating that, you know, we are hitting the vulnerable populations with their home buyout. And I think that's more of a function of that's where they that's where the, the home values have, have gone down and, and that's where they are. So so but now the question is, you know, what do we need to look at differently than what we've done in the past? Right. You keyed up the next piece perfectly. So what is needed for the future? Uh, we've got a few ideas listed here, but what do you see are the key things that you need um, either from stakeholders, other cities, or just in terms of data to help you all plan for the future strategically with that um, design piece that um, was mentioned earlier? So as far as uh, future climate extreme events, everything we talk about when we talk about the 100 year flood, we're talking about the existing conditions model. We are not looking at a full development. 25 years ago, we did some, some full build out models, but those were based on what we thought the development patterns would be over the next 25 years. We did not anticipate the infill development that is occurring today. So these models could show that there's going to be a six inch difference or it could be a four foot difference. And if we have those models, then we've got to make the decision on how we're going to use them. Are we then going to use those models for, for regulating new developments? And would those, would those differences in, in future conditions change us to where we go to buy out? So that's one thing we need. Um, as far as uh, vulnerable populations, again, as I've said, you know, we have not been looking at the data that's available to us as our decision making process. We have also not been tracking whether we're buying a house from an owner, um, you know, who, who wants to stay there forever or if they're thinking about renting it out. We do not track historically where the folks go. And when folks say they are not interested in the buyout, we don't really track why. But with the current Corps of Engineers project that we've got going, since we are paying to relocate the folks that either live there or own an owner occupied, we are tracking where they go. So we do know you know, that, that these people were not allowed to stay in the community because the housing market around them went so crazy that, that they couldn't afford it. So we need to start tracking those sort of things. Um, and then finally, with the strategic planning efforts, you know, right now we've, we've shown you that we're actually, the three different strategies that we're using, we're actually treating folks differently. And it may be a case that you have one street where I've used all three methods of home buyout and we've treated each individual property differently. So we need to, to, to get to where we're, you know, again, we think that, that the way we're doing the core engineer where we can pay a little more for the house, we hope that that is gonna turn the corner and, and allow people to be able to stay in the community where they wouldn't in the past. Um, and the last thing I need to say as far as, you know, vulnerable populations and living in the floodplain or living anywhere, if it can rain in your area, it can also flood in your area. So we really need to do a better job both locally and nationally with the National Flood Insurance Program to promote the buying of flood insurance. If you have a flood and, and if you have a flood and have flood insurance and you need to use that money, you need to file a claim and you need to get back on your feet. A lot of people also don't realize that a renter can carry flood insurance for their contents. So that's one thing we've been trying to do lately, but it's something that I think we can improve on. All right. Um if we could, and I appreciate that, yes, I uh, fully believe we need to um, encourage people to have flood insurance, um, both renters and owners alike. But um, if we could circle back briefly, you mentioned something about the Corps of Engineers practice and 
Um, do you see potential for that more risk-based approach and a more equitable approach for buyouts? Um, could the city adopt something like what the Corps is using to help people stay in their community? Um, because you've mentioned that with the Corps of Engineers approach, you can pay for relocation. And given the national housing market, it sounds like some people with fair market value may not be able to stay in the area. Um, so can you speak to that a bit? Yes, we can. So, so essentially, you know, with the FEMA projects, we can only pay fair market value. So if we choose to to do what we're doing with the core projects, then we will have to figure out where that money comes from in our in our operating budget. Um, so that's 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 one issue that we need to definitely look at. Um, we do again with the core. I've said that they will actually qualify houses for elevation in place, and so in those cases, we pay the extra money out of our own pocket to take that house down. So we, you know, again, we think that's, uh, you know, that's based on the numbers, but again, the fact that that most people who drown in floods are in their vehicles, either going to or from their properties, we think that if you leave the house on the property, there's still a lot of risk there, and that's an un unacceptable level of risk that we're willing to take for our citizens. All right. And how do you see data on vulnerable populations possibly playing a role in future planning for Nashville? That's an excellent question, and we're open to suggestions. I mean, that's where we are. And again, you know, we didn't set down that path with the history of what we've been doing so far. And at this point, we're at 398 houses that we bought and taken out. And there are some areas that Jennifer was showing that the areas that we were in when we took the houses down 10 years ago those populations were much more vulnerable than they are now because of what's happening with the housing market so we we are we're open to suggestions on how we can take this information and how can we improve on our ability to keep people part of the neighborhood and you know if, if they say no they're not interested in the offer you know why is that and what can we do to 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 make them uh, to make them be able to take that offer all right thanks tom I think now we're going to shift to Q and A. Um, so, uh, Janie, go back to yeah that slide. <clears throat> this yeah. is Phil Bain, everybody. Um, for those of you that want to ask questions, please feel free. I have a couple questions of my own, but I do want to point out that the goal here is this is a multiple session, what we call collaborative engagement. It's not intended to be a bunch of talking heads, and I think you already get that sense just that. Um, between Faye, Janie, Roger, Tom, and myself, we've actually had a number of other conversations about these very issues, and this is all part of that conversation. And what we're doing now is going outside of our small group and soliciting help from other cities and experts. And that's really what this whole collaborative engagement is about, because nobody can assume that they know all of it, and uh, even experts you know, have their own particular view of it. So we will have uh, next week a couple of breakout sessions and we'll send everybody an email and give you a chance to um, you know, either be part of a group with uh, Faye and Laura Kemp from the Metropolitan on Master Planning or possibly the data or even solutions with Tom. So we'll break it out into different groups. I wanna put a fine point to this though, um, to, to Tom and, and it may even go back to, um, to Faye. And that is that it seems to me that the data tools that you've had to date have helped you manage sort of crisis and immediate situations. And I think, you know, both Jennifer and Roger alluded to that. The solutions that you have are somewhat um, binary in the sense that you either buy out, you invest in green infrastructure, possibly uh, gray infrastructure. But what started this whole conversation between Faye and I was the idea that you needed one to be able to predict and plan for the future, which is something you weren't doing. And you also possibly needed a more holistic approach, which could cost less um, because maybe it's an investment in the community as opposed to just a binary, you know, we're going to build a berm or we're going to buy somebody out. So I'm sort of throwing that into the into the group, not sure who wants to answer that, but I think it really boils down to two things. What's the overall goal? 
um, in terms of uh, not just social vulnerability, but community. And then secondly, what's the goal with uh, what we call predictive analytics? Uh, some people call it digital twins, the idea is that you can model futures and make decisions. So maybe let's go first with the modeling decision. Maybe Tom, Roger, or Jennifer wants to answer that. And then Faye can maybe give us a little bit of a bigger picture on the goal. So, so yeah, as far as, you know, looking at these future developed conditions models, you know, again, like I say, you know, we looked at those years ago, but the look we looked at years ago did not include what's actually happening today. So I think, you know, the, the low hanging fruit for us, especially in the home buyout area, the, the repetitive loss list for FEMA has always been that low hanging fruit where we know that every time it rains, there's going to be another flood loss on this street. So we've kind of taken, you know, we've, We've gotten rid of a lot of those. We're still working in those areas, but we haven't looked at what's going to be the next area that's going to have future low-hanging fruit. You know, what areas are going to change due to climate change and 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 infill development? You know, where are we going to be creating other areas that are going to be our new hotspots? And that's that's information that we don't currently have. So I think Tom. So I you think could, oh, I was going to say. Go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry. I think yeah. that plan. That's where planning it can come in, um, probably with the help. Um, and i have in talks with the Corps of Engineers of our looking at our po at the planning's policy, their National Next Plan, taking that data from those types of things, along with current trends in the data, so we have access to the permits and demolitions and things like that, um, and taking that data and putting it into a um, more of a future development plan, maybe with um, a little bit more knowledge about than we did 25 years ago when we did those types of plans. So I, I think that planning um, policies and plans are good input into that kind of, those types of models. It isn't part of the issue there though that um, my understanding from what I've read is that FEMA, Corps of Engineers, they all have different data. Um, and, and they don't, and if you try to extrapolate them out, you, you don't really get consistent. And then of course there's some private organizations now that are publishing even more data on the effect of climate change on flooding. So Jennifer, what's the, I mean, do you have any, how do you handle all these different types of data? Well, um, we, the, 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 our, our FEMA data that is here is actually produced by the local Corps of Engineers office um, with their contractors here in Nashville. So we provide, as a city, we've partnered with them getting like the latest LIDAR data for late, the most up-to-date elevation data. We've provided them uh, the Corps of Engineers data on our parcels and, our, and our, our infrastructure here in the county. So our FEMA data is based on through that modeling done by the Corps and then on to FEMA. So I feel like in that aspect, we have kind of a good plan. We, it's not two different entities kind of working on it separately. Um, but we're always looking for other data that might be available, continuing to get updated LIDAR, um, working with, we've done that through our partnering with the state and the USGS, um, continuing to get more, you know, as far as real-time monitoring and, and placing that, continue to work with the USGS about gauging and the weather service about um, notifications. And so that we're all working together on a team going towards the same kind of goals um, is important. And I'm Thank gonna you. add a point here. University partners like us at Vanderbilt are working with the downscale climate data that can help also look at, you know, mid-century and century level pro projections for precipitation or changes in precipitation that can be used to model some of those you know, worst case scenarios that can inform modeling and planning for the future. I'd like to add so too. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. I'd like to add too that we need to do a better job of, of letting people know what your flood risk is, you know, know your flood risk. There was a NPR story yesterday where people are buying houses, not knowing what their fire risk is, not knowing what their flood, flood risk is. And there's too many, too much emphasis on, am I in the floodplain or not in the floodplain? Everybody's in a flood zone. Everybody's in a flood zone, whether you're high risk or, or at the edge of high risk. So if we do these new models and come up with where we know that things are going to change in the future, we've got to somehow make that information available so that folks can quickly and easily look at that. And it may not be that we're using that new data 
as a as a tool for steering development and, and requirements, but it could just be a matter of making sure that people know what their flood risk is and understand where they're buying. Right. Philip, this is Faye. One of the other things that I think is really important, and it goes back to the that broader notion of equity by design um, and all the things we're talking about is one of the things that um, cities across America what that in these predictive tools and data-driven decisions and all that is this notion that our, our built environment is unintentionally oftentimes having consequences on these most vulnerable populations. Even when, when we're talking about these sort of data-driven decisions, the notion of, of a much more comprehensive view of the community and what the aspirations and aims are for that community and then how again back to how that is achieved in each and every component as it is designed and built um i think that's something that we've been missing for a while we've always had goals and aspirations um we've we've long we, i mean getting into data-driven decision making is not something terribly new at this point i mean i think a lot of communities are doing that but i think being very mindful about that how each project and how our infrastructure um, individually and collectively contributes to communities that really are uh, designed for everyone and consider um, in a very um, meaningful way the impacts to everyone, whether that's with flood management or transportation or whatever it might be, that that infrastructure is one of the sort of fundamental uh, measures of how well we're going to be able to achieve equity in a community, the built environment. Let me follow up on that, Faye, because we have a couple of questions, but Janie, I'll direct this to you and then you can sort of we'll determine who should answer it. So one question which really follows up exactly on what Faye was talking about is, um, does Nashville take into account what you would call non-quantifiable social benefits? Do you allow for that in any of your modeling or when you you know go for your three solutions green gray or buyout so um i'm gonna probably direct that to tom but i think up to date nashville is not necessarily looking at those alternative benefits um, beyond the fact that we did a study at vanderbilt for metro water looking at the benefits of the home buyout program trying to quantify some of those um benefits of the buyout converting land to green space but i'm concerned that as a whole it's not necessarily doing that um tom do you want to speak to that well we do again anecdotally feel that that if you have an area if you have you know one row of houses that's on the creek and then they flood it over and over and over again those property values tend to go down which also tends to bring down the property values of the houses across the street so whenever we buy out a house, we try to be the best neighbor in the neighborhood. We cut the grass, we cut it every two weeks, we keep it nice. If a tree falls, we go pick it up. So we're trying to make our properties an asset to the neighborhood. And again, we encourage, you know, responsible use of our properties. You know, so if, if the neighbor wants to go, you know, throw frisbee with his kid across the street in the in the park now that we've created, you know, we, we let that happen. So So clearly you have a policy towards that. But you obviously, but you're not, and and it is difficult, I, I would submit, to quantify that, you know, and to include it in your modeling. So, yeah. Um, the next question, which is a little bit um, uh, tangential to this, is, and I think this goes sort of to the sensor issue, is um, what is Nashville doing in terms of mobility issues when the flooding occurs? And this is more of the immediate response, the first use case under safe how are you informing people of where it's safe to drive or not thrive or possibly um you know go to i'm gonna say that jennifer is probably great to answer that and she's smiling so she's gonna <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, be generous so, I, i've heard her <laughs> so that is, that is difficult so um immediately after the flood um you know before safe was invented it came out and we put this together one of the big things was like what people need is information um we need to be proactive where do you do, don't where don't you drive where do you need to get out and we developed a program called nerve which is our um nashville's emergency response viewing engine <laughs> we like um and nerve is our where we go and we put down we work with the at the eoc during events then we put roads that are closed um and in that part of that is we work with 
the people in the EOC, um, with the police that are there, with the public works department, to go out and, and get them information based on what we see through SAFE um, and through our now our um, HEC modeling to where we need to close roads down before people drive across them. You know, we have we have roads that we know at certain levels uh, of, of the gauging that we're reading real time that are going to go underwater. Um, and we try to get that information through list out to the police so we can have people out in the field monitoring it. I'm not gonna lie and say that that is an easy process over the years, staffing changes, um, you know, infrequencies at the EOC make it hard to, re you know, know who the next, who you contact um, today mm -hmm. would be versus last week. But um, we continuously try to work with um, and come up with solutions um, to make sure that that information is out there. But there, there are, I de definitely are looking for, you know, other ideas about how, how we communicate that. Um, we know through our part like partnership with possibly like ways getting information out to that. Um, there's, there's other possibilities, but we're looking forward to other solutions. So that's, that's one of the things that we could come back to, uh, along with predictive data modeling, one of the things we could explore, and of course that's part of our schedule, is what other kinds of sensors are out there that we could use, and, um, and possibly how could we model what that data is providing us. I think the last question we have, uh, I think is for you, Tom, and this may be a little bit of a, a history of the CORE's buyout program, but um, the question was um, about um, assuming that you are buying out homes that were high risk but have been permitted, is that part of the the, the um, course program that even though, I mean, so for instance, are these old homes that were originally permitted or are these homes that may be um, newer and there's a question about whether you should be buying them out? So I think it's a history lesson a little bit about your buyout program and the core. It's... Um... So we did not have any flood maps until 1982 in our community. So mm -hmm. predominantly everything that we're buying up to this point has been those older homes that were built prior to 1982, prior to us having those that flood information available. And we have, and since since 1979, we've had a requirement that that there's a four foot freeboard requirement for residential structures. So everything that's built new today has to be four feet above the flood elevation. In our May 2010 flood, you know, we have parts of the county, like especially on the on the Harpeth River. If we would have only had a hundred year flood event, there would have been it would have been Tuesday the next day. It wouldn't have been a big event. But due to the fact that the Harpeth River was nine feet above flood stage, even the houses that were built four feet above also had four feet of water in. Them. So I think that that again, what we've seen so far is that, you know, only in rare occasions have we bought a house that was built in the last 15, 20 years. Everything we're buying is, is historic before 82. Great. Thank you, Tom. Janie, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to point out yeah, also go. is Tom mentioned education and outreach and challenges with that. And I think that ties to NERV and getting information out to the public because everyone's not going to necessarily check NERV um, to know what roads are closed and things like that. But it also ties to what Faye is talking about of the design and considering those vulnerable populations. So, you know, we need to think about whether or not NERV is designed to reach those that may have limited accessibility with smartphones or otherwise and language barriers. Um, so that we are meeting people where they are and um, the best way to communicate with them. Um, I think that's another takeaway we could focus on. Um, yeah, and, th and that actually brings up a question from me, Janie and Faye, and um, we really didn't talk about it, but I think one of the things we've already discovered is that um, when you look at the CDC Social Vulnerability Index is that we really haven't come up with how do we deal with renters. Um, there's been some questions about how you communicate with them. Um, a lot of times you're dealing with the building owners, not the renters themselves. Do you or uh, does anybody on the team want to provide a little bit of color there? Because obviously this is something that we would really like to know from other cities what they're doing uh, with renters. Um, well, we actually just um, submitted a paper for review at Vanderbilt um, looking at renters as a forgotten vulnerable population for um, hazard mitigation. 
Um, so that's still in review, but we've had conversations with Tom and Roger and um, Jennifer and Roger, you want to talk about Lewis Street apartments? Sure, and, and Lewis Street is one of the one of our our, our great examples of of a, of a of a of a well-intentioned idea that was actually implemented in a very bad place. Uh, it was a building. It was kind of an apartment building that uh, that flooded significantly during the 2010 flood. Um, within months of the water going down. Um, we were approached um, by an organization that uh, that that fosters affordable housing, um, and we we sought ways to uh, to appropriately permit the reconstruction of this building. But there's no way to elevate a building in that nature. And it, as it turns out, over the the decades since, it, it's one of our it's it's on the top of our list of of, uh, of sensitive places. Um, that house uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, and we literally, on a couple of occasions within the last 18 months or so, have had to go into that apartment building uh, in the middle of the night uh, to, to remove people uh, in wheelchairs uh, because the water was already in their apartments. And, uh, and this, it's, it's just a, it's an issue of you know, a good idea in a real bad place. And, and um, so it's incumbent upon us to, uh, as we permit construction of new facilities, um, that that uh, that there's awareness of the potential risk uh, for a site that's in close proximity to a floodplain. Um, it's um, it's a challenge for us, and and but it's so critical uh, because ultimately these people um, uh, they end up in a shelter somewhere that has to be. They have to ride a bus 15 miles to get to the shelter. Well, how do they get home when the when the shelter closes? This uh, there are, there are a myriad of, of issues associated associated with what is a very vulnerable population. Right, and I brought that up knowing it's a challenge because that's something that hopefully we can solve with input from other communities. But it's also something that the regulations and funding from FEMA and uh, the core and other places may limit what you can do in some of those situations. So it's a bigger issue than we can necessarily manage on our own here. Um, if if and, I'm and understanding I'll, correctly. And I'll just state that it's it, it for Metro, it's been um, just knowing where our rental population is, is um, difficult. You know, there's data from the census on owner occupied or, or, or non, um, but getting data that's not, you know, in an apartment complex, it's easy to know for land use that that is a rental. But there's a lot of houses that are for rent um, or back back apartments that are for rent and things like that. Knowing where all our rental property is is, is, is a challenge. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. Great. Uh, wrap us Thank up. you. Thank you for that. So, yeah, I'll wrap it up now for the audience. And um you have in front of you the upcoming schedule. And just like we were agile at the beginning, uh, this is intended to be an agile process. I think what you've heard from Nashville is that, you know, we're really interested in sensor solutions. We're really interested in data model, especially new data sets and predictive data modeling. Um, we're also interested in um, uh, the, the idea of social benefits and the last, uh, use, the last situation we talked about with Roger where you know we're not taking into account all of the additional costs by trying to help these vulnerable populations and many of these and, and Janie brought that up too so the idea is if you have any um, suggestions on our breakout sessions next week if you think um, and I'm talking about people outside of Nashville please email me you'll you have a copy of the presentation and you have my email below we're open to suggestions we really want um, people to come in and discuss it's not uh, talking heads. And then as you can see at later dates in November and December, we're going to do some deep dives into different solutions with experts from Vanderbilt and other universities and experts that are uh, members of the council. And then we're also going to start working on our roadmap because our ultimate goal is to help Nashville publish some kind of plan that they can use to accelerate the process. And this will be a plan that will normalize and share with other cities. So if you participate you'll actually get something out of this that you could use. With that, thank you for your time, and everybody have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.